All right, English 3, a uh, few things. Some of you still haven't turned in the final for the modernism unit. You need to get that taken care of. Now, we're getting back into the journal. So our journal topic for today is, have you ever had a mentor, someone who you look up to as a model of who you want to become or because they have a skill quality that you want to possess? So it could be a coach, a teacher, an older sibling, uh, a friend, someone you work with. Just someone that you look up to. Now, this idea of a mentor is going to be playing a big part in the book we're going to start reading. Now, if you check, if you picked up your book, your boxes, you'll notice that each in each box, again, there should have been a copy of this book, Bless Me All Twelve by Rodolfo Anaya, and a copy of the study guide. Yes. And before you guys ask, yes, I already have a co I have a record of which books that I put for each person. So everyone's got a copy of it. And worst comes to worse, I have an uh, I have a PDF version that I'll put I'll send to you if necessary. Cat, I know I had to send one to you. So I figured, let's get started. So again, you need to be putting these journal entries into a document, and that you'll share it to me at the end. You'll share with me. All right, so. Bless Me Ultima by Rodolfo Anaya. A few things about our author. Unlike all the other authors we've read this year, ours is still a lot. This one is still a lot. So a few things. If you turn to page one inside your study guide, you can read along. Rodolfo Anaya was born in Santa Rosa, New Mexico. His father was a vaquero from a family of cattle workers and shepherds, or sheep herders, I should say. His mother's family was composed of farmers from Puerto de Luna and Pecos Valley of New Mexico. Anaya grew up with two half-brothers from his mother's previous marriage and four sisters. From his mother's previous marriage and four okay. Okay. Or previous marriage and four sisters. The beauty of the desert flatlands of New Mexico, referenced as the Llano as in, in Anaya's writings, had a profound influence on his early childhood. Anaya's family really relocated from rural New Mexico to Albuquerque in 1952, where he was in, when he was in the eighth grade. He got, attended Albuquerque High School, graduating in 1956. When he was 16, Anaya was left temporarily paralyzed following a swimming accident. This experience later appeared as an autobiographical illusion in his novel Tortuga. Following high school, he earned a B.A. in English and American Literature from the University of New Mexico in 1963. He went on to complete two master's degrees at the University of New Mexico, one, for Eng one in 1968 for English and another in 1972 for guidance and counseling. While earning his master's degrees, Anaya worked as a high school English teacher in the Albuquerque Public Schools from 1963 to 1968. In 1966, he married Patricia Lawless, who continues to support his writing. He began writing Bless Me Ultima in 1963 with the manuscript completed and published by Quinto, del, Quinto Sol in 1972. Initially, Anaya faced tremendous difficulty getting his work published by mainstream publishing houses because of its unique combination of English and Spanish language. Yes, there is a lot of Spanish in this book. Now, for my non-Spanish speakers, you'll notice I did also include a glossary sheet. I would kind of I'd, the reason why I didn't put that in as a handout is because I or as a PDF is I wanted you to have that with you while you're reading the book. That's another reason why I gave you the physical copy of the book, so you have so even if the computer's being used, you can still be reading that. So, when published, it was a massive success. Okay, it was. <laughs> as well as its Chicano-centric content. Now, Chicano is going to be a term that we're going to be using quite a bit in this unit. Chicano pretty much is a term that some people use to describe Hispanic Americans. So this is a big piece of Hispanic American literature, and is considered one of the first real p mainstream pieces of it to ga gain some form of recognition and success. So the book went on to sell over 300,000 copies and 21 printings, Following the book's success, Anaya was invited to join the English faculty at the University of New Mexico, where he taught until his retirement in 1993. Bless Me Ultima was released as a full-length film in on February 22nd, 2013. Yes, you can find the movie on YouTube. No, I would not recommend using it as a substitute for reading the book, because the assignments and the quizzes are based off the book, and the movie doesn't have everything in it. 
believe me, I used I normally would show the vid show the movie at the end of this unit or show portions of it during the course of the unit. We're gonna read the book. And I has also published a number of books for children and young adults. His first children's book was titled The Fa Familios of Christmas. It was published in 1995. He currently resides in Albuquerque and spends several hours daily writing. So, that's our author. All right, so the plot. A general, uh, uh, the way I would condense Bless Me Ultima is this way. It's the story of a six-year-old boy, Antonio Mares, and the awakening of his consciousness. He is growing up in a small New Mexico town shortly after World War II. An old woman, Ultima, a curandera, that term means folk healer, comes to live with his family and guides him in his journey towards adolescence. Now, there's a special term for a story like this. I'm going to grab my board here. That I'm, we're gonna, that I'm going to show you. So... Stories like this, we call them coming-of-age stories. Usually because it's about a young person effectively coming into adulthood or adolescence. Uh, great examples of that would be Jane Eyre by Emily Bronte. You could, you could almost say Holes. You could almost say The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Pretty much where you have a story where you have a young person coming through a journey and becoming an adult. That's what we call a coming of age story. Or, to be fancy, a be fancy, a Bildungsroman. Bildungsroman. That's the term for a coming of age story. So this is very much a Bildungsroman. So, the setting. The setting of this novel takes place in rural New Mexico. It's a world of vast plains of nature. The Llano is the term they use to this, that Anaya uses to describe this area. It's very much, you could almost say it's kind of like our part of Colorado, where we have these flat plains, but, but it has like rolling hills as well. So it's very much ranching country. And the setting almost becomes a character and how much it has an impact on the plot of the story. Yeah, it's a world of vast plains of nature. The Yano yet is also close to the developing world of progress and established restricted society. This conflict is going to be showing up quite a bit throughout the course of this novel. And this, I, this repeated idea is what we call a motif. We're going to be seeing this motif of rural versus civilized a lot in this story. It's not the only conflict we're going to be seeing. So we're going to be seeing this term a lot, motif. All right, so our characters. Our protagonist is Antonio. He's a six-year-old protagonist, ages to eight years old over the course of the, of the novel. And his journey is similar to a heroic quest from innocence to maturity through experience. Like when we talked about Eudora Welty and the hero's journey, we get to see that with Antonio. And our title character is Ultima, an elderly curandera, an alternative medicine woman, folk healer, who comes to live with Antonio's family and serves as his guide. And she possesses mystical powers and enlightenment. There are some people who actually consider her a witch, but we really don't. But Anaya leaves that up to our leaves us uh, leaves it up to us to decide if she's a witch or not. Our other major characters: we have Antonio's parents. We have Gabriel Mares and Maria Luna. Gabriel, his father, is a vaquero or a cowboy. He feels free spirited, a rat wants a restless lifestyle. That was the call of his ancestors. And his mother, Maria, likes the farming tradition of being settled and tranquil. She's a modest and devout Catholic and wants Antonio to become a farmer or a priest. So his father is a cowboy and his mom is a farmer. And these familial influences are going to have a massive impact on Antonio during the course of the story. Now, 
This book is considered a prime example of Ameri of an American version or an American example of what we call magical realism. Magical realism is fiction that maintains a realistic narrative while recounting fantastic or supernatural events alongside commonplace occurrences. One great way of describing it was the ordinary is where they describe the ordinary as miraculous and the miraculous is ordinary. This actually is a genre that has its roots in Latin American literature. And because they were because mostly it came from this desire to try and reconcile the indigenous beliefs of the native people and the Catholicism that was brought on by the Spanish conquistadors. So we're going to be seeing in this story elements appear in an otherwise realistic setting. And then, so we're going to be seeing, like, witches, magic, a magical fish. And this combines a combination of physical reality and psychological reality. Because there are some people who think that all these magical elements that we see are actually from the interpretation of Antonio's point of view. So that's a question we're going to... I'm going to address over the course of this unit is, is this stuff actually happening or is it purely from Antonio's perspective? Okay, a few things. Magical realism is different from fantasy because it remains grounded in the real world unlike science fiction and other non-realistic genres. The big thing about magical realism is that it is reality plus a little bit of magic. And it stretches the definition of realism and reality. Like, what is considered real? What's considered fantasy? And magic realism deal deals with not so much a belief, but a lack of disbelief. Uh, like, when we're watching a movie, we could tell that something's CGI. Or something was a special effect. But we don't care. We, ca we call that the willing suspension of disbelief. It's like we understand that... We, yeah, we can understand that Chris Hemsworth really can't fly when swinging a hammer. But we suspend our sense of disbelief willingly so we can enjoy the movie this is one of the big things when it comes to magical realism is us suspending our sense of disbelief and one of the biggest best ways of describing magical realism is that power lies not in answers but in questions we are probably going to have more questions and answers while reading this book and that's okay okay Another big thing about magical realism is that landscape and setting have a big impact on, on the plot. Usually, magical realism pieces have vast, mysterious terrain. So in this case, we have the Llano, these plains and hilly areas in rural New Mexico. And these tend to, and magical realism stories tend to, they'll have you, they'll range from snow-capped mountains to volcanoes and waterfalls to vast deserts, where the landscape and the setting will be a character in the story almost and a big thing when this again ties back into the conflict between native culture and christianity is that there's a blending of the two there's a blend of old mystical culture with colonization and christianity all right okay a couple of literary conventions that we're going to be seeing quite a bit it juxtaposes opposing elements dreaming waking life death civilized wild when you juxtapose something you're showing it's like a it's a comparison that shows more it that reveals more information it like highlights the qualities of the two things being compared of course, hyperbole. That's exaggeration until something becomes magical, like a childlike look at the familiar and reimagining of the mundane. Like how many of us, when we were children, we thought that something that we learned was, was normal, we took that as being very 
magical. Like it's almost like we'd see our parents putting something together and then it has say close your eyes and they do voila and boom, there we go. And another thing about magical realism is that the text acts as a mirror. It pretty much forces us to question what is reality? What is real? What is the issue of belief? So, the big thing that I'm going to be asking for you guys to read by the end of the week is I'm asking you to read chapters 1 through 9. Which ends... Excuse me. On page. So that's pretty much pages 1 to 82. Yeah, chapters 1 to 82. Okay, pages 1 to 82. Pretty much we're going to be doing about 9 chapters for the first two weeks, and then we're going to have. By the looks of it, then we'll have four chapters that last week. So, figured I would get us started. I'll at least read us the first chapter. So, if you open your books up, hopefully this will not get struck for copyright. Turning to page one. You notice all the chapter titles are going to be in Spanish. At the very least, you're going to learn at the end of this unit, you're going to learn to count to 22 in Spanish. So, uno. Ultima came to stay with us the summer I was almost seven. When she came, the beauty of the Llano unfolded before my eyes and the gurgling waters of the river sang the, to the hum of the turn, turning her. The magical time of childhood stood still, and the pulse of the living earth pressed its mystery into my living blood. She took my hand, and the silent magical powers she possessed made beauty from the raw, sun-baked Llano, the green valley river valley, and the blue bowl, which was the white sun's home. My bare feet felt the throbbing earth, and my body trembled with excitement. Time stood still and it shared with me all that had been and all that was to come. Let me begin at the beginning. I do not mean the beginning that was in my dreams, and the stories they whispered to me about my birth and the people of my father and mother and my three brothers, but the beginning that came with Ultima. The attic of our home was partitioned into two small rooms. My sisters, Deborah and Teresa, slept in one, and I slept in the small cubicle by the door. The wooden steps creaked down into a small hallway that led into the kitchen. From the top of the stairs, I had a vantage point into the heart of our home, my mother's kitchen. From there, I was to see the terrified face of Chavez when he brought the terrible news of the murder of the sheriff. I was to see the rebellion of my brothers against my father, and many times late at night, I was to see Ultima returning from the Llano, where she gathered the herbs that could be harvested only by the light of the full moon, by the careful hands of a curandera. That night, I lay quietly in my bed, and I heard my father and mother speak of Ultima. Esta sola, my father said. Ya no queda gente en el pueblito de las pastoras. Again, my Spanish is non-existent, so please forgive me if my, Spanish, if my pronunciation is horrible. He spoke in Spanish, and the village he mentioned was his home. My father had been a vaquero all his life, a calling as ancient as the coming of the Spaniard to Nuevo Mexico. Even after the big rancheros and the Tijanos came and fenced the beautiful Llano, he and those like him continued to work there. I guess because only in that wide expanse of land and sky could they feel the freedom their spirits needed. Que lastima, my mother answered, and I knew her nimble fingers worked the pattern of the doily she crocheted for the big chair in the sala. I heard her sigh, and she must have shuddered too when she thought of Ultima living alone in the loneliness of the wide Llano. My mother was not a woman of the Llano. She was the daughter of a farmer. 
She could not see the beauty in the Yano, and she could not understand the coarse men who lived half their lifetimes on horseback. After I was born in Las Pasturas, she persuaded my father to leave the Yano and bring her family to the town of Guadalupe, where she said there would be an opportunity in school for us. The move lowered my father in the esteem of his compadres, the other vaqueros of the Yano who clung tenaciously to their way of life and freedom. There was no room to keep animals in town, so my father had to sell his small herd, but he would not sell his horse, so he gave it to a good friend, Benito Campos. The Campos could not keep the animal penned up because somehow the horse was very close to the spirit of the man, and so the horse was allowed to roam free, and no vaquero on the Llano would throw a lazo on that horse. It was as if someone had died, and they turned their gaze from the spirit that walked the earth. It hurt my father's pride. He saw less and less of this of his old compadres. He went to work on the highway, and on Saturdays, after they collected their pay, he drank with his crew at the Longhorn. But he was never close to the men of the town. Some weekends, the, the Llaneros would come into town for supplies, and old amigos like Bonnie and Orcampo, so the Gonzalez brothers, would come by to visit. Then my father's eyes lit up as they drank and talked of the old days and told the old stories. But when the western sun touched the clouds with orange and gold, the vaqueros got into the trucks and headed home. And my father was left to drink alone in the long night. Long night. Sunday morning, he would get up very crudo, and oh, crudo. I remember the, if I remember the pronunciation, and complain about having to go to uh, go to early mass, hungover. She served the people all her life, and now the people are scattered, driven like tumbleweeds by the winds of war. The war sucks everything dry, my father said solemnly. It takes the young boys overseas, and their families move to California where there is work. Ave Maria Purissima. My mother made the sign of the cross for my three brothers who were away at war. Gabriel, she said to my father, it is not right for La Grande be alone in her old age. No, my father agreed. When I married you and went to the Llano to live with you and raise your family, I could not have survived without La Grande's help. Oh, those were hard years. Those were good years, my father countered, but my mother would not argue. Then it isn't a family she does not, did not help, she continued. No road was too long for her to walk to its end to snatch somebody from the jaws of death. Not even the blizzards of the Llano could keep her from the appointed place where a baby was to be delivered. As for her dad... My, mo my father nodded. She tended me at the birth of my sons. And then I knew her eyes glanced briefly at my father. Gabrielle, we cannot let her live her last days in loneliness. No, my father agreed. It is not the way of our people. It would be a great honor to provide a home for La Grande, my mother murmured. My mother called Ultima La Grande out of respect. The great one. The important one. It meant a woman was wa old and wise. I have already sent word with Campos that Ultima is to come and live with us, my father said with, sac with satisfaction. He knew it would please my mother. I am grateful, my mother said tenderly. Perhaps we can repay a little of the kindness La Grande has given to so many. And the children, my father asked. I knew why he expressed concern for me and my sisters. It was because Ultima was a curandera, a woman who knew the herbs and remedies of the ancients, a miracle worker who could heal the sick. And I had heard that Ultima could lift the curses laid by Bruhats, that she could exorcise the evil the witches planted in people to make them sick. And because a curandera had this power, she was misunderstood and often suspected of practicing witchcraft herself. I shuddered and my heart turned cold at the thought. The cuentos of the people were full of the tales of evil done by Bruhats. She helped bring them into the world. She cannot be but good for the children, my mother answered. It's the bien, my father yawned. I will go for her in the morning. So it was decided that Ultima should come and live with us. I knew that my father and mother did good by providing a home for Ultima. It was the custom to provide for the old and the sick. There was always room in the safety and warmth of La Familia for one more person, be that person stranger or friend. It was warm in the attic, and as I lay quietly listening to the sounds of the house sleep falling asleep and repeating a Hail Mary over and over in my thoughts, I drifted into the time of dreams. 
Once I had told my mother about my dreams, and she said that they were visions from God, and she was happy because her own dream was that I should grow up and become a priest. After that, I did not tell her about my dreams, and they remained in me forever and ever. Now, you'll notice that at the time... On page five, it starts getting into italics. When it's in italics, this is one of Antonio's dreams. If you'll check the back of your work of your packet, you'll notice there is a dream journal. So, Lesame Ultima is filled with Antonio's dreams. In these sequences, a lot of the boy's fears and perceptions about religion and his family are vividly portrayed. These dream sequences are imaginative and beautifully written. They allow the reader inside the mind of this little boy and to see his internal conflicts. To do this, the reader must understand the dream's meaning. So, in the first column, we're going to summarize, cite the number, uh, and we're going to analyze figurative language in, the cited, in a cited quote. And then in the second one, we're going to do analysis. So this is the first one. In my video for next week, we're gonna go. We'll go over any of the dreams that that were taken that took place during your course of your reading for this week. So, our first dream. In my dream, I flew over the rolling hills of the Yano. My soul wandered over the dark plain until it came to a cluster of adobe huts. I recognized the village of Las Pastoras, and my heart grew happy. Our one mud hut had a lighted window, and the vision of my dream swept me towards it to be witness at the birth of a baby. Couldn't make out the face of the mother who rested from the pains of birth, but I could see the old woman in black who tended the just-arrived steaming baby. She nimbly tied a knot on the cord that had connected the body baby to the mother's blood, then quickly she bent, and with her teeth she bit it off the loose end. She wrapped the squirming baby and laid it at the mother's side. Then she returned to cleaning the bed. All linen was swept aside to be washed, but she carefully wrapped the useless cord in the afterbirth and laid the package at the feet of the virgin on the small altar. I sensed that these things were yet to be delivered to someone. Now the people who had waited patiently in the dark were allowed to come in and speak to the mother and deliver their gifts to the baby. I recognized my bro mother's brothers, my uncles from El Puerto de las Lunas. They entered ceremoniously. A patient hope stirred in their dark, brooding eyes. This one will be a Luna, the old man said. He will be a farmer and keep our customs and traditions. Perhaps God will bless our family and make the baby a priest. And to show their hope, they rubbed the dark earth on the river of the river valley on the baby's forehead, and they surrendered, surrounded the bed with the fruits of their harvest, so the small room smelled of fresh green chile and corn, ripe apples and peaches, pumpkins and green beans. So the people of his mother's family arrive and they surround this baby with signs of the earth signs of farming then the sh silence was shattered with the thunder of, hoof of hoofbeats vaqueros surrounded the small house with shouts and gunshots and when they entered the room they were laughing and singing and drinking gabriel they shouted you have a fine son he will make a fine vaquero and they smashed the fruits and the vegetables that surrounded the bed and replaced them with a saddle, horse blankets, bottles of whiskey, a new rope, bridles, chapas, and an old guitar. They rubbed the stain of earth in the baby's forehead and because man was not to be tied to the earth, but free upon it. These were the people of my father, the vaqueros of the Llano. They were an exuberant, restless people wandering across the ocean of the plain. We must return to our valley, the old man who led the farmer spoke. We must take with us the blood that comes after the birth. We will bury it in our fields to renew their fertility and to assure that the baby will follow our ways. He nodded for the old woman to deliver the package at the altar. No, the Llaneros the Llaneros protested. It will stay here. We will burn it and let the winds of the Llano scatter the ashes. It is blasphemy to scatter a man's blood on unholy ground, the father chanted. The new son must fulfill his mother's dream. He must come to El Puerto and rule over the loneliness of the valley. The blood of the Lunas is strong in him. Yes, Amares, the Raquero shouted. His forefathers were conquistadores, men as restless as the seas they sailed and free as the land they conquered. He is his father's blood. Curses and threats filled the air. Pistols were drawn and the opposing sides made way for battle. But the clash was stopped by the old woman who delivered the baby. Cease, she cried. And the men were quiet. I pulled this baby into this light of life, so I will bury the afterbirth and the cord that once linked him to eternity. Only I will know his destiny. 
The dream began to dissolve. When I opened my eyes, I heard my father cranking the truck outside. I wanted to go with him. I wanted to see Las Pastoras. I wanted to see Utama. I dressed hur hurriedly, but I was too late. The truck was bouncing down the goat path that led to the bridge and the highway. So, you're going to read through the end of chapter 9 by the end of this week. So that's going to be page... And that's going to be page... 82. So when it says Diaz, stop. So, the way assignments are going to work, you're going to have a quiz at the af after each three chap after every five chapters. No, no, I'm, I'm going to rework that. Not five chapters. Pretty much, I'm going to have a quiz every uh, about every six chapters or so. Pretty much, expect two quizzes this week. We'll be over like chapters. One through four. The, the second one will be, be five to nine. Yes, there will be open book. Yes, there will be open study guide. That's another reason why I gave you a physical copy of the study guide so you can use that to complete the, st complete the quizzes. So, the assignment is going to be due by noon, not midnight, noon on Sunday. If you have any questions, please let me know. Nine to, nine to 11, one to three are my office hours. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next lesson.